benvenuti a tutti a questo nuovo appuntamento di Weird Edizioni con le sue interviste e oggi abbiamo il piacere di avere con noi Thomas Arenstam di Fria Liga. Benvenuto. Benvenuto, welcome, welcome. Thomas. Thank you. E siamo molto contenti di questa intervista perché è probabilmente la prima volta che Thomas parla a noi e al pubblico italiano. E le domande sono moltissime, siamo molto curiosi di scoprire come è nata Fria Ligan, chi è Thomas Arenstam e quali sono i progetti che ha ancora in cantiere e che ha ancora segreti. Right, so uh, I've been playing role playing games I guess since the 80s I started. It was a big thing in Sweden back in the 1980s. Uh, mm. There were many Swedish role playing games and I was of that generation in the mid 80s when all of these games came out. Back then we the games in Sweden, we mostly played Swedish games, not uh, American or English games so much. So that's how I started out. Uh, like it was a big thing back then here, almost every home, like all the kids played role playing games back then. So, and so did I. And uh, some of us have kind of stuck with it throughout the years and, and never quite gave it up, even though I had had some periods of my life when I didn't play so much. But late in the last 10, 15 years, I've kind of picked it up again. and. And also, I've been writing role-playing games ever since I started playing them almost. I think I wrote my first one when I was like 12 years old or something, and I never quite gave that up either. So um, I kind of have had other jobs. So I was a journalist for quite some time, and I did completely different kinds of work. Um, but then I started freelancing uh, for a, a game company about 10 years ago, uh, 15, yeah, around something like that. And that kind of grew. And it uh, became Free League, and uh, it kind of all grew from there. And, and now it's, uh, it's my full time, full time occupation. Come hai proceduto a sviluppare il sistema motore che sta dietro le, tutti i giochi di Free League? Cioè, parliamo del, del Years System. Come puoi indicarci le, le differenze eh, con altri sistemi? importanti o generici. Uh, right, actually that started out uh, when we did, I did the rules design for, for our first games that we freely released were only in Swedish and that was in 2012, the first one, and we had another one in 2013. And then in 2014 it was actually our third game, it was Mutant Year Zero, and that was the first one we did in English. Uh, and for that game, uh, I designed a rule system that uh, for Mutant Year Zero, and uh, it was never intended to be used for any other games back then. There was no plan to do that. But uh, this, the game after Mutant Year Zero was Coriolis, and we tried a number of different rule systems for Coriolis, and we never quite got it to work and didn't quite find something that we liked. So uh, I think it was like the third or fourth try, we just said, why not try the Mutant Year Zero system and see if that, that works? And we kind of felt that it did. Uh, and of course, with some changes and tweaks, it's not identical, but it, it's the same core. So we decided to use that and go ahead and, and, and do that. Uh, so um, that kind of turned into the game system. And the third game we did uh, with the system was Tales from the Loop. And that was written by an external designer, but by then we had figured it might be a good idea to actually keep some of the core game system and use it in Tales from the Loop as well. So uh, that, uh, it was a freelance writer called Neil Tintze. He designed the rules from the Year Zero core engine. So, and then it kind of just grew and we started developing it as its own separate uh, rules engine. And we've been doing it, we've been using it for pretty much all of our games uh, since. And it kind of helps because It's also easier for, for, for people out there who don't know us very well, maybe, and they have tried maybe one game and they want to try something else that we've done, then it's, a, it's easier if you already know the rules, kind of, or at least how they work, um, basically, uh, if you have played one. So it, it makes sense to have a rule system that is not exactly the same because you still want it to be adapted to, to the setting, but s similar to, to uh, other games that we have released. Is there a base concept you're using to decide what uh, is to be changed to adapt a system to a setting? Yeah, uh, I, that's kind of the key thing that we, that's how we think about game design and rules design, that it's not just meant to be there to simulate uh, reality or something. It, it's meant to enhance or promote a special kind of story. So it's always, you need to, it needs to really work with, uh, with the setting. So. 
And that's, we try to find to identify some core theme of the game, and that needs to be brought into the rules also, not just the setting. So that's why we have the stress mechanic in Alien. We have yeah. the prayer mechanic in Coriolis, which is a lot about faith. And we have different uh, themes that come into the rules. So what we try to do is to identify like the core theme and then find a way to bring that into the rules also, while still keeping the the core rules mechanics, how you roll the dice to keep them pretty much uh, the same. So that's the kind of work that we do for every game. A proposito di questo, volevo chiedere a Thomas, eh, proprio per le differenze del sistema tra eh, Coriolis, Tales from the Loop e Alien, e abbiamo notato eh, che c'è una differenza anche di, di concetto riguardo alla gestione delle avventure laddove Coriolis c'è una, una scelta privilegiata di eh, avventure abbastanza lunghe e campagne in Forbidden Lands per esempio ci sono missioni e non vere e proprie avventure in questo senso e lo stesso si può dire in Alien che sono state introdotte due modalità diverse, una cinematografica e una invece come campagna, e, e che in realtà danno al gioco una dimensione e un modo um, per game master e giocatori di, di scegliere eh, come, come giocare, qual è il loro modo migliore per affrontare il gioco. Volevo chiedere a Thomas il perché e la ragione di queste scelte. Right. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of similar to the way we approach uh, rules that the, the adventure or, or design needs to follow the theme of the game and work with what kind of setting we, where the game is, is uh, about. So for Alien, it made sense to have a focus on a kind of cinematic feel. It feels like you're in the, an Alien movie, and that means fairly short, condensed, uh scenarios that are more like one shots and since it's a horror game in a sense um and then just looking at the alien movies where you're not expecting all the characters to survive so we we create this cinematic mode of play where it's almost i mean just reading what people write online it's like how you died can be a fun thing to discuss you don't even expect your character to live on to the next scenario that's not kind of the point of the game the point of the game is to experience this this thrill, this uh, this horror in space, and and so that's kind of how we approached adventure design for for Alien. Uh, other games like Forbidden Lands and Mutant Year Zero and others are much more. Uh, there we have a sandbox approach because those games are all about exploration, and and it's a uh, sandbox is, is is a concept we use where uh, it's an open world kind of game where the players can go where they want and do what they want. So it's a very open game and it's more of a campaign uh, focus game because you're not just supposed to play it once it's more of a longer term and uh, with a lot of control given to the players themselves so you don't need to follow a specific track you can go where you want and kind of do what you want that's the philosophy behind those games because they're about exploration uh, for Coriolis and I also think Simba Room are um, games that have a more classic approach to adventure design. Those are more pre-written, longer stories, longer campaigns that are not, uh, that are fairly uh, predetermined what will happen. Not every, of course, every detail because you still have decisions to make as players and there is, uh, but overall, the overall kind of story is, is decided beforehand. So those games have a more classic approach. So it, it all depends on the game and the setting and what type of experience that we want to create for the particular game, how we approach the adventure design. So uh, I guess that's sort of how we think about that. Ed eccoci invece alla prossima domanda. Quello che ti vorrei chiedere è quando e soprattutto come è nata Free Alligan? Free League was actually born as uh, we did, we're just a group of, of friends uh, who, who um, we started doing some writing for another uh, company, another uh, uh, role-playing publisher here in Sweden uh, back in the mid-2000s, so it's about 15 years ago. Uh, they were called Jan Ringen and they were the ones who later did uh, Simbarum and who even later than that joined forces with Free League. So now we're actually 
in the same company together. But back then they were a different company and they did a version of a classic Swedish uh, RPG called Mutant. Uh, that's the same franchise as Mutant Year Zero, but this was the first edition of that game came out in the 80s. And then the, Jan Ringen did a version in the 2000s that I played a lot and, and we actually met this group of writers and friends, we actually met through through that game. And we started doing work for this freelance work just for fun for this company. Uh, and they also created the first edition of Coriolis. Uh, that was the, their uh, uh, their second game. So they had produced their version, version of Mutant and then Coriolis, which was their own game. And uh, Jan Ringen, this, this publisher, the name Jan Ringen means Iron Ring, and it's actually a faction from Mutant, from the original version of Mutant. There was a group in the game called this uh, Jan Ringen. And in Coriolis, there is a group called Free League, or Free League, and it's a group in the game. So we kind of thought it was fun that they took a name from, from Mutant, and we would take a name for our group of freelancers that would be taken from the Coriolis universe. And that's why that's where the word Free League comes from. And if you look in Coriolis, the game, there is still a faction in, in Coriolis that is called Free League. So that's, that's where the name came from. So uh, what happened was that uh, Jan Ring and the original first Jan Ring and they they uh, went out of business. They shut down in 2011, and by then we had started working with them quite a lot. And we were working on another game, a fantasy game, with them. And I was doing some rules design for them, but then they decided to to shut down. And, uh, and then they asked us, "Do we want to?" take over this project for this new game and continue to publish things for Coriolis and, and, and so on. So we thought about that and we decided to go ahead and to do that, we needed to start an actual company and, and do this properly because before that we had only been doing this for, 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 for fun and, and, and so on. But then now at this point in 2011, we started the company Free League to take over these things from, from Jan Ringen. So that's what we did. And the first game, the one that actually started as a project by Jan Ringen that I worked on was our first game called uh, Svavel Winter, which is a fantasy game that's only in, released in Swedish. And we re released that in 2012. And that's kind of started the whole thing. And then we did our own version of Mutant. So Mutant, the game that is an old Swedish RPG, has kind of been stayed with us the whole time because Jan Ringen did their version. And then we in Freely did our version, Mutant Year Zero. Uh, so it's kind of stayed with us. And then later on, Jan Ringen was reborn as a new the new Jan Ringen that came along in 2014 or something. And they did their new game called Simba Room. So, but then we were different companies. Uh, but then in a couple of years, we, we, since we knew them very well from before, we, uh, we always discussed, could we work together more? Could we help each other out? How should that work? And after a couple of years, we just decided it made sense just to, to merge uh, the companies completely and join forces and create one company instead of two. So we did that about two years ago now. So now the Jan Ringen and Free League are, are one and the same. So uh, and Simbroom is a Free League game also. So it's now it's all one big family. A proposito di Kickstarter, sembra che voi abbiate trovato una formula magica per grandi campagne Kickstarter. Il successo locale è fondamentale per renderlo grande su Kickstarter? I guess it's um... I think we started out doing crowdfunding. The first couple of crowdfunding campaigns were not even on Kickstarter because back then, this was in 2013, uh, you could not do a Kickstarter in Sweden. You had to be an American or, or English company. So yeah, that's, that's the first couple of campaigns we did were on other platforms and we just tried it out. Um, we had no idea what we were doing, really. It was very much an experiment, uh, but it turned out pretty well. So I think um, and yes, I think it helps to have done, and the first ones we did were only for the Swedish market. So I do think it helped because that meant we could try it out and, and learn from it. And then uh, we started doing international campaigns and international uh, Kickstarters in English. Um, but definitely, it, it, I think it does help to have that kind of home base to, to like, like a core a group of fans. Uh, now we have those all over the world, but at the, in the beginning they were in Sweden. and I, I think we still have that kind of base, which is uh, which is nice to have, and I think it helps uh, helps the Kickstarter campaigns even now. Una cosa su cui tutti quanti invece siamo molto curiosi è che cosa ci possiamo aspettare da Free Aligan nel prossimo futuro. 
Right, and we have a lot going on. I mean, right now I'm working on a game called Twilight 2000, which is a new edition of a pretty classic uh, American game. So we're doing that. We're doing lots of more stuff for for uh, the Alien RPG. We have uh, more things for Forbidden Lands, a starter set for Simbaroom, a new campaign book for Coriolis is coming very soon. Uh, that's being pre-ordered right now. So. Yeah, it's a lot of things happening in the next couple of months uh, yeah. and years uh, ahead. Abbiamo parlato di Coriolis, noi siamo, diciamo, grandi fan di Coriolis, mm -hmm. abbiamo yes. pubblicato praticamente tutto quello che è uscito e quindi siamo, siamo curiosi anche di sapere <ride> le, le novità. Quindi volevo chiedere a Thomas innanzitutto se oltre alla campagna che deve uscire a breve hanno qualche idea anche per uno sviluppo della linea in modo diverso o con eh, alternative nuovi scenari atlanti o cose di questo genere we are doing a lot of work for Coriolis it's um we are now running a pre-order for part two of the big campaign the big campaign is called mercy of the icons it's a three-part campaign and we're doing a pre-order now for part two which is called The Last Cyclade. So that's happening right now, and we'll release that book uh, in December, so toward the end of this year. And then we're already working on part three, uh, the final part of this campaign. So that's the main focus right now for Coriolis. But we also have big plans for more things after that uh, on all kinds of... Yeah, I, it is, I don't have anything to share at the moment of, in terms of details, but... We are definitely planning big things for Coriolis because Coriolis was is one of our own games. It's not a licensed game like uh, Alien and even Tales from the Loop actually and, and Mutant Gear Zero also. They are licenses, so we don't own the the, the brands, the content. Uh, it's uh, they were doing them as a license uh from other companies but coriolis uh forbidden lands and simbaroom are our three games that are fully our own that we uh, we own the brand and everything completely and uh coriolis we actually uh it started out as created by jan ringen then when they shut down they actually sold the rights to the name the brand uh, to someone else and only about a year ago we uh bought it back so we actually bought the, the name the brand back again so it's now it's ours again so and that also means a bit of an investment so so we are definitely planning big things for Coriolis in the years to come ok adesso parliamo sempre di un altro gioco sempre di fantascienza questo è un gioco di licenza che è Alien allora Alien ehm, quali sono state le difficoltà se ci sono state che avete eh, dovuto affrontare nel progettare il gioco e come eh, state lavorando e qual è diciamo lo sviluppo della produzione di Alien del prossimo futuro. Yeah, Alien was an interesting design challenge since it's such a famous brand and and so many people have so many feelings and, 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 and thoughts about Alien because it's been around for over 40 years and, and not, of course, all of these movies and, and also books and comics and everything. So it's, uh, you need to think differently when creating a game like that compared to Coriolis, for example, where we can make pretty much decide, make up anything we want because it's our world and, and, and we have created it ourselves. For Alien, we had to, there are like two parts of, of the challenge. The one is to get things right, just so we have to make sure that we present the universe correctly. And that's where uh, the, where uh, Drew Gaska, uh, Andrew Gaska, who's the setting writer, comes in. Because he's, even though we are all in Free League like Alien fans, uh, we're not super experts on the Alien universe, but that's what we needed someone like, we needed uh, Drew Gaska, who's like the the, the expert on, on this. So we brought him on as a consultant, as a setting writer, and he's also writing scenarios. So that's one part. And the other thing that was more on my side was to how do we actually create a game that is fun to play and that kind of feels like you're in an Alien movie. And that has a lot to do with the rules design and the game design. And the focus there was to get a rule system and a structure for scenarios that feels right for this universe. And that's where the stress mechanic comes in and the signature attacks for the xenomorphs and to really 
yeah, a, a sense of a very deadly game and that kind of plays out a bit like an alien movie. So that's uh, that that was the challenge there. But it was um, a lot of it was a fun challenge, and I think it turned out pretty well. Avete quindi intenzione di continuare la produzione di Alien? E quali sono gli sviluppi che state progettando? Yeah, we're working right now on the next uh, next module for Alien. It's a campaign book. So far, we have only the only modules we have done have been these cinematic scenarios that I the, that I talked about. The first one was Chariot of the Gods, and then now recently Destroyer Worlds, and they're both kind of one shot cinematic scenarios with pre generated characters and and they're supposed to be played as they are with these characters and, and you're not expected to all survive to play on uh, with the same characters. The other way to play the alien role-playing game is the campaign mode. And that's what this book is for. And that's for playing much longer campaigns with the same characters over a longer period of time. And that will also change the way the game plays a little bit. It won't be quite as deadly. And because if you want to play campaign, you need a bit more survival on part of the characters. So this campaign book is focused on colonial marines. Those are the soldiers that you'll see in in the, in the aliens, the second the second movie. So this is a campaign book to play not just one scenario, but a range of missions and explore this world. And it's a chance to play campaign mode is a chance to explore the alien universe in a lot more detail and go all over travel through space where you want to go and do these missions and, and so on. So and this campaign book will have a campaign in it ready to play and lots of information about the colonial marines and their backstory and and, and background and their gear and equipment and things like that so it's uh, we'll be doing more of these campaign books uh, uh, for alien also as you go forward because it's uh, yeah. that style of play yeah. also allora, in una recente intervista abbiamo sentito che Gasca racconta che i eh, giocatori di Alien eh, dovranno a Thomas il fatto di non morire nei primi cinque minuti delle avventure di Alien perché Thomas ha, de ha deciso di ridurre la mortalità, la presenza di xenomorfi. Eh, Com'è lavorare con Gasca? Yeah, we we're working closely and it's it's been really good. Like I men mentioned, uh, he's a really a great alien expert and is also a, 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 an author. He's writing write, writes novels, science fiction novels. So he's a great writer and he knows alien really well. Uh, but where we need to compromise and talk is that is how to turn this into something that works as a game. Yeah. And he has lots of good ideas there also, but what he tends to do sometimes is that he thinks it's really cool to have more of everything. And I keep telling him that it may be not always a good idea because A, it can be just too deadly. If you throw in, if you throw in everything at once, you have like no chance to survive. And that's, you know, it's supposed to be deadly, but it's no fun if it's just, you know, it needs to be the right amount of deadly. And also he likes to have like big things, like lots of things, like big places with lots of people, lots of xenomorphs. He needs to he likes to add more. And I keep taking things away to make them more streamlined and a little bit more easy to handle for a game master to kind of the it if there's too much going on in a scenario, it it it's very hard as a game master to keep track of everything and it just gets very confusing and messy and it's, it can be very hard to play. In a role playing game, there is so much going on anyway at the table where the players are doing their thing and you need the story needs to be fairly straightforward and it, you need to be able to keep track of it as a game master. Yeah. I think Drew is more used to writing books and in a book you can you have full control of everything as an author so you can just throw anything you like in there. In the, in the role playing game, you need to be a bit careful not to overload Things. So that's the kind of discussion that we often have. Molto bene. Adesso invece passiamo ad un altro titolo che comunque sia va a rappresentare anche la grafica di questa chiacchierata, quindi la quale siamo tantissimo affezionati, non vediamo l'ora di poter giocare anche qui nella localizzazione italiana che appunto Weird ha annunciato di recente. Noi ti chiediamo per favore se ci puoi introdurre Tales from the Loop e soprattutto raccontarci come nasce la collaborazione con Simon. Yeah, uh, Tales from the Loop is a game uh, that we released a couple of years ago. It's um based on uh, an art book or narrative art book by uh, Simon Stollenhog. And uh, we met him 
it must have been uh, 2013, so it's like seven years, a long time ago now. Um, and it, because he uh, it started out just doing this, these art pieces that were kind of a countryside, typical Swedish countryside suburbs, but with these robots and machines and dinosaurs in it. And they were really cool. And, and he just posted them on a blog and, and it started getting some attention. And, and we thought this was really cool. And someone actually was not actually not us. It was another person who thought we should publish uh, Simon's work as an art book. Uh, and suggested this to us. And we said, well, this might be an interesting idea. So we just had lunch with Simon and this other guy, Magnus, uh, just to talk and, and see. And we kind of hit it off. We kind of immediately kind of found a way to, uh, decided to do something with this. So that ended up uh, being publishing his first art book, first only in Swedish, Tales from the Loop, the art book in Swedish. Well, that was published in 2014. But since we had already, we were doing role playing games, it kind of was very natural for us to think about how to turn this into a role playing game. And we published the art book in, uh, in English the year after, and we had a Kickstarter for that that went really well. So it kind of took off the whole thing. And then we decided to, to turn this into a role playing game too. And then uh, uh, that we had a, a writer that I mentioned, it was Hintze, who did that, who wrote the tales from the loop RPG based on Simon's art book and my year zero uh, engine rule system. And he used those and created a great role playing game that we published in 2017. And it turned out pretty well and won a bunch of awards at the Ennies and, and was our, like a big, kind of a big hit uh, game for us. Uh, so it's, um, and then we did a, a game based on Simon's second art book, Things from the Flood, and, and uh, we're working with him now on his other art books and, and uh, new games, and we're doing a Tales from the Loop board game. So it kind of all started with those uh, that art and that art book uh, from Simon back uh, some years ago. Quali sono le differenze fra l'ambientazione svedese e invece quella americana? E soprattutto come hai fatto ad esprimerle queste differenze appunto in gioco? Yeah, that was a bit of a challenge since the, the setting in, in Simon's art book uh, and the most of the art, it shows a very typical Swedish countryside or, or suburbs. But we knew that because the art book had done really well uh, out in, all over the world, really. So it felt like it probably captured something for for everyone, not only not only for, for, for Swedish people. So. But when we did the role playing game, it was a bit of a challenge and we figured maybe it's a bit too narrow to only have the game set in Sweden. It felt a bit limiting. So we figured since the US is the big market for us, uh, it made sense to have a, 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 an American setting too. And we also wanted to create the sense that this game could be set anywhere. So if you want to play in Italy or, or wherever you want to play, you can set the game wherever you want. And it's easier to, to get that point across if we present two settings and not just one, because if we present just one setting, then it kind of becomes the default. But if we present two, we kind of show that you can actually play the same game in different, different places in the world. So, and there is a small section in Simon's original art book, Tales from the Loop, that is actually someone who goes through like a strange portal and ends up in Boulder City, Nevada. So there's like a couple of art pieces showing that. Yeah. And that kind of made us think that this would be kind of cool to have that as the American setting. So that's what we did. So we got, got an American writer called Matt Forbeck to write the, the chapter about the American setting. So we got things, you know, right. Uh, and we used that art from, from Simon's first art book uh, to present the setting. And then for all of the scenarios, we did maps and handouts and all of that. We did like in dual form. So every non-player character has like two names, one Swedish and one yeah. English and, yeah. and so on. So yeah. we tried to create everything uh, for both uh, both settings uh, for every module that we do for the game. Passiamo adesso invece alle domande della community. In particolare qui Giuliano della Tavola Rotonda ci chiede Tales from the Loop. Quali sono i tuoi suggerimenti per creare il nostro loop? 
Uh, right. I mean, that's uh, a good question. I mean, th this is really cool to see uh, the, the translated versions of Tales from the Loop, uh, the game, because all of we, it's already it's been published in, in France and it's coming out in Poland and, uh, and, and in Italy, of course. And, and every, every edition has done their own version of the setting of, of the loop, which is this, that's exactly how I think the game should be played. It, it's the kind of, of course, you can play in America or Sweden or wherever you want, but I think it, it works best if you play in your hometown or somewhere you, knew, you know very well, because sure. it's about teenagers growing up. And that's much easier to imagine if you set the game where you grew up or at least a place that you know very well so uh it's mostly a matter of i think most of the themes of the games are fairly uh international and and general like what it's like to grow up what it's like to you know be in school and have all that kind of stuff going on and then solving these strange mysteries at the same time i think it's it's you can play that you can set that game in any country in the world almost so it's mostly a matter, I think, about getting, like maybe you need to do adapt some of these organizations that show up and so on. But I think the themes are fairly, uh, fairly uh, universal. So uh, I think uh, you you'll do a great job of creating your own your own loop. I think you should you'll do a better job at that yourself than 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 me telling you because I don't know I don't know Italy that well, even though I love the country. But in general, do you suggest uh, a country setting or a city environment for the loop? Uh, I think it's most of the, uh, I mean, the, the Swedish setting and the, 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 the US setting also. And there's, we also published a, a UK setting, actually, uh, that is official also in, in a module. And they are usually kind of rural locations, suburbs or countryside. Most of them are not like big cities, I guess. The big cities could work. I haven't tried that, so I wouldn't really know. But I think it's uh, it works well in the kind of setting where these characters, which are kids, teenagers, they can kind of roam around, run where they want, ride bikes and go places. And I think that's maybe easier in kind of the countryside or suburbs than in, in the middle of a big city or something. But I guess that could work too. But uh, so. Uh, we just have to try it, I guess. Mirko, dalla nostra community, ci chiede come è nato il design del logo di Free League. Yeah, the the Free League logo is it's also an interesting thing that goes back to the roots. Uh, really, uh, it's kind of a. I didn't do the logo myself, so I, but so I, the, our artist, uh, graphic designer Christian, it, it knows this better than I do. But I uh, know it pretty well. I think that the symbol, the logo of Free League, it's it's a, a flower, it's a lily flower. I don't know the word in Italian, but it's a, it's a flower. And it actually refers to the name of one of the creators of Coriolis, because uh, from the original Jan Ringen publisher, his name is Matthias Lilia, and Lilia means lily in Swedish. So it's actually a bit of a, a play on, on his, uh, and he was the main designer of Coriolis. So it's kind of, this, our logo is actually kind of a tribute to, to him in a way. Invece Matteo ci chiede questa piccola curiosità. Fra tutti i titoli che comunque sia Free Alligan ha nel catalogo, qual è quello a cui sei maggiormente affezionato? Well, it's hard to choose one title, but I think one that it's uh, right now, I'm, 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 I mean, the one that is, I'm working on right now is, is Twilight 2000, which is kind of a game that has stayed with me for also from very early on. So it's great to be working on a new edition of that. I think maybe if I have to choose one that kind of stayed with me throughout the years, I think it would be Mutant Mutant Year Zero, which is our first game that we did internationally. And the first edition of Mutant is also the first roping game that I ever played when I was 11 years old. So it's kind of the one game that has always, always been with me. So if I guess I'll have to choose one, it, it, it'll have to be that one. Molto bene, direi che questa splendida chiacchierata con Thomas è arrivata alla fine, purtroppo. Non è... Il tempo vi assicuro che durante l'intervista è personalmente volato. Speriamo che questo video vi sia piaciuto e che le piccole curiosità appunto che abbiamo tirato in ballo siano state di vostro gradimento. Vi invitiamo comunque sia a iscrivervi al nostro canale Weird Edizioni e lasciare un bel mi piace perché potrebbero arrivare tantissimi contenuti analoghi a questo nel prossimo futuro. Perciò iscrivetevi, mi piace e noi ci vediamo alla prossima! Grazie Thomas, grazie. grazie. Thank you Thomas. Thank you, Thank you, Thomas. Thomas.